Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, landmark chambers, Herbert Smith Freehills and Montague Evans webinar on the future of heritage planning and the effects of the Court of Appeals decision in Brams Hill. Uh, we're delighted to see so many of you joining uh, the session today, and we hope that you will find the presentations and discussion to be uh, useful and informative. My name is Matthew White. I'm a partner at the law firm Herbert Smith Freehills, and I'm head of planning in London. And I'm going to chair today's session, and I'm joined by Annika Holden from Herbert Smith Freehills, Zach Simons from Landmark Chambers, and Chris Mealy and Rosie Adamson from Montague Evans. Uh, just before we begin, a few housekeeping points. Your microphones are automatically muted, so you will not need to adjust your local settings. Um, we very much welcome questions throughout the session. Please submit them via text in the Q&A section, which uh, ought to be found at the top or bottom of your screen. And we'll endeavour to answer some of these questions at the end of the presentations. Uh, now, this webinar is being recorded uh, and you will receive a link to the presentation and the recording shortly after the event concludes. Um, if at any point during uh, the webinar your connection is lost, then please rejoin the meeting by clicking on the original link again. Now, since deciding to run this webinar um, some weeks ago, we've hit something of a purple patch for heritage decisions uh, with the Whitechapel Bell Foundry decision uh, and subsequent Twitter tailpiece from the Secretary of State. Uh, Mrs. Justice Lang's judgment in the Sydenham Hill Estate case, which I think if I stretch, I could just about see out of my window today. And then as recently as Friday, we had uh, Sir Duncan Oosley's judgment handed down in the London Chest Hospital case in Tower Hamlets. So Zach and I are going to be discussing the key lessons to be drawn from those decisions later. But first, uh, I'm very pleased to say um, that we're going to start with a presentation by uh, Chris Mealy. Um, Dr Chris Mealy is a senior partner at Montague Evans, uh, planning and property consultants based in central London. He's a chartered planner, a member of the Institute of Historic Buildings Conservation. He began life as an academic architectural historian and continues to publish and lecture in that field and amongst other things is an honorary professor at Glasgow University. And he has specialized in planning and the historic environment for more than 30 years, but uh, his full head of hair uh, suggests otherwise. Chris, over to you. Well, well thank you very much, uh, Matthew, and, and good afternoon. I just opened the seminar by reflecting how different it is today for us planning professionals who specialize in heritage than it was say in March, 2013. I mean, then we had the newly minted framework, which presented us, we thought, with a clear roadmap. Simple, straightforward principles, no wrong turns. How much did those of us then really know about case law and how relevant was it to us on a daily basis? Well, I suppose I could list a few that will be sound like old friends. There was South Lakeland on the meaning of preservation. There was Shimitsu on the meaning of demolition. There was Monaghan on the meaning of enabling development, used first in relation to land use planning, then heritage. And in a, a body of authority that dated back to the Victorian period that explained the way in which a chattel could magically become a fixture when dealing with a listed building. Since then, there are now more cases than I think any of us can really keep track of. We have Barnwell Manor, Bedford, Forge Field, Mordew, Rottingdean, Palmer, Boehm, Brams Hill in the Court of Appeal, and just last week, Juden in the London Chest Hospital case. What does this proliferation of judgments tell us? I think first it tells us that heritage is a tough one for decision makers. It's fraught with hazards and tripwires. The risk for practitioners is a little subtler. The catalogue of names that I've just run through, I think, seduces us into thinking we have to recite and even analyze this body of case law and somehow keep track of how the last decision altered the previous ones or not. Now, I'm not saying that these judgments don't clarify areas of practice, but I wonder whether they really change the fundamentals as expounded in the framework, framework way back when 
which itself sits within the limits of the 1990X provisions. Now, I'm not really sure that they do change those basics, um, which I think are pretty simple. Now, here a confession. When I offered this view to Zach, Matthew, Annika, and Rosie in the prep session, for this uh, webinar. I got a full chorus back in return. That's exactly right, Chris, they said, and you are just the person to spell out those basics for our audience on the 25th. And so to set the scene for this discussion. And so here I am, I think, left holding what I might call the heritage bag to present you simple, a simple seven step plan to good heritage practice. It might just be all you really need to know. And I express it as a series of steps. The next slide, please. Step one, the significance of a heritage asset which is affected should be identified and assessed, and it may be archeological, architectural, artistic, or historic. Significance may rely in part on setting, either directly or indirectly, by enabling an appreciation of certain aspects of significance. Step two, assess the impact on the significance of the identified asset or on their setting. By the way, impact on setting is not the test because setting is not an asset unless it's designated. Step three, by that same policy I just cited, which is 193, great weight, that's the words used, the words used, is attached to the conservation of that asset's significance. Now, I think this requires a little bit of explanation. Conservation as defined in the framework glossary means both the avoidance of harm and the delivery of enhancement where appropriate. Now, as a consequence of this, 193 read together with the statutory provisions, any harm to a designated heritage asset is so-called weighted harm. That means harm existing somewhere above ordinary planning harm. A point often overlooked in relation to 193 and the great weight provision is that great weight must attach equally to aspects of development which are harmful as to those which are beneficial. And as an aside, I will observe that the benefits of development are sometimes given short shrift in responses from consultees, rightly or wrongly. However, it seems to me the act of conservation in the positive sense should count for a lot on the plain meaning of framework 193. And so back to our stepped program four, if the proposed development is held to cause harm to significance, such harm must be categorized as either substantial or less than substantial as per 195 and 196. This too requires a brief explanation. Within each category, the extent of harm should be clearly articulated, and the support for that is in the practice guide. But I think it's also obvious, since it's not possible as a matter of planning judgment to balance off harms against benefits unless the decision maker forms a view on the nature and extent of those impacts. Here, on the meaning of substantial harm, as set out in 195, I will reach for the case law because it does clarify what amounts to substantial harm and what does not, and very usefully. To the extent that there is any test available to us to define substantial harm, it is, I believe, set out in the Bedford judgment. This has it that substantial harm occurs when either all significance is removed from an asset or very much drained away. This formulation, I suggest, also indicates an approach to less than substantial harm in cases where a high level of less than substantial harm is asserted. In essence, a high level of less than substantial harm is getting pretty near to the underside of the boat called substantial harm. Step five, any harm requires a clear and convincing justification, which over the years has proved to be a bit of a minefield. For the avoidance of doubt, and again, as the judges have pointed out, a clear and convincing justification does not create a freestanding test in planning. It does not mean demonstrating less damaging alternatives, at least in the case of less than substantial harm. I do, I, I am concerned about the use of the word justification in what is paragraph 194, because it creates a kind of spectral presence, suggesting to some that a consent causing harm can only be granted if there's no less damaging alternative. This came up in the Bramshill case and alternatives can matter sometimes when demonstrating, for example, optimum viable use. Another thorny question, I know Annika will return to it, around the harm benefit balance is whether 196 is engaged if any smidgen of harm is caused or whether you engage 196 only if having weighed up harms and benefits, you reach net harm. 
The first is the so-called Palmer approach, and it was a big topic at Browns Hill and we'll see. And it also featured prominently in the Juden judgment from last Friday. I think it's the one that probably puts the whole thing most comprehensively, or at least more than any of the others. And if my reading late last night is right, then what the judge found was that sometimes it's perfectly fine to net out the harms and benefits and sometimes not. And, or even perhaps more radically, that one should take a rather relaxed view to this whole matter and not get tangled up in debating a contentious point. Because after all, whichever route you take, you get to the same place, a net view of impact. All that matters is you go about your business in a transparent, methodical and reasoned way. Step six, a short point, the penultimate one, in either case, the clear and convincing justification the framework requires are countervailing public benefits. And these can include benefits to assets, urban design benefits, land use benefits, anything material to planning, which is a very great deal. And finally, step seven, which underpins all the above and runs across it is what I will call the proportionality principle. The more important the asset, the greater its potential sensitivity to change. That said, it would be unreasonable, as one recent inspector put it, for a very limited impact on a World Heritage Site, say, to tip the scales firmly against the grant of any consent, just because a World Heritage Site is at the top of the heritage tree. It's the nature and extent of weighted harm, or come to that weighted benefit, which must be taken into account in the exercise of planning and also professional judgment. So there you have them, I hope, seven simple principles with a little elaboration. Now I'm now going to pass over to my colleague, Rosie Adamson, who worked with me on the Bramsfield case to set the scene for the legal analysis, which Annika will deliver. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much, Chris. And I'm sure everyone was, was rapidly scribbling down those principles <laughs> as being of incredible use um, in, in future applications. Um, so Bramsill is, is, a, is a very important case um, that I'm sure everyone has read very closely. Um, we're now going to hear from Rosie Adamson uh, about the facts of the case. And Rosie is a, an associate partner uh, at Montague Evans. She's been there since 2014. She holds an MA in archaeology of buildings from the University of York and a BA in history of art from the University of Warwick. She worked on the Bramsell applications, as we've heard, and later the appeals, and has worked with uh, Chris on a number of specialist enabling development cases, including highly graded listed buildings. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you, Rosie, about the details of the case. Thank you, Matthew. So I hope to set out over the next few minutes the broad principles of the Bramsfield case to give some context for the topics we're discussing today. So I'll start with a quick overview of the site and the proposals and then introduce the points at issue, which Annika is going to expand on. And I think it would be fair to say, just by way of introduction, that this is one of the more complex cases that Chris and I have worked on in relation to the assessment of heritage impacts. And I'll come to the reasons why. Brownsville, uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, is a historic estate in Hampshire in Hart District. It was last used as an international police training college and that remains its lawful use. And the site contains an extremely important Jacobean house of the early 17th century, built uh, in part to accommodate the king on royal progress. And the house is set within gardens and parkland, which are themselves a really important survival of a Jacobean uh, design landscape, and which includes original features such as these formal axes and this large engineered uh, lake. Both the mansion and the parkland are designated Group 1, and there are numerous other listed buildings associated with the House of Grounds on the site. So overall, it's a quite spectacular historic survival, and its overlapping designations really reflect that. And the site was bought on a freehold basis by city and country in 2015. And by that point, it was vacant. Um, and it had been since 2013 when its police college use for the Home Office had come to an end after a 60 year term. And I think it's just worth mentioning that um, I understand the site was considered by the National Trust. Um, its maintenance, uh, though, was considered to be too expensive and it was not taken on. The Trust, however, is a beneficiary of a covenant and so has an interest in the land. But returning to the Home Office use, that really resulted in two things for the estate. And the first was a quite remarkable renovation 
um, you can see that the kind of legibility and decorative schemes um, through the survival of some really significant spaces, including you can see here the, the state apartments. The, the second effect though was a much more intrusive one in landscape and visual uh, setting terms through the construction of this 20th century campus. And this really has a marked visual presence in the immediate setting of the mansion, which is also one of the most sensitive parts of the registered park and garden. So you can see here it interposes between the Jacobean Lake and the house, lying across one of those principal axes which would have linked the two. You can see it more clearly in this photograph. The basic principle of the city of country proposal was an eliminated one. So to deliver the repair and beneficial use of the mansion and the restoration of principal landscape features funded through development in the registered park. And just to give you an indication of the scale of that task, the conservation deficit at the time of the inquiry in 2018, I believe stood at around the 30 million mark. And we do quite a lot of these cases. And in our experience, there's always a debate as to the amount of enabling development that's needed. And to deal with that in this case, uh, the applicant put in three applications for the grounds. So to, to assist those discussions around quantity during the determination period. Landscape, which has been harmed, and the proposals would remove those most harmful elements of the police college. They would reinstate elements of the landscape which had been lost and would secure its long term maintenance. And that was achieved within a footprint which was very similar to the amount of existing development already on the site. And in addition to that, there are three different applications were also put forward to the house. And first was its conversion to multiple residential units um, with those most significant interiors, which I showed you just a second ago, retained as publicly accessible spaces. Second was its restoration um, to a single dwelling. And third was its refurbishment in its existing use as offices. So the inspector had to go through a detailed and rigorous process in weighing up six appeals in potentially nine different combinations and forming a judgment for each one in relation to first the house, second its setting and third the registered park and garden. And the relative merits of all of those were debated at length um, by the appellants, the local authority, Historic England and the National Trust over the course of a five week public inquiry. And one of the key points in the case was whether or not paragraph 196 of the MPPF was engaged at all. And that was through applying this principle, sometimes referred to as the inter internal heritage balance, which Chris has already touched on. And this principle, as I said, comes from the Court of Appeal Judgment, known as Harmer. And for those of you who unfortunately are not familiar with that case, it was a 
So, and very briefly, there was a question around what constituted the correct baseline for the assessment of heritage impacts. Other parties at the appeal confirmed in their evidence um, that their assessment hadn't taken into account the police college development. And so where they started in relation to the judgment on harm was a different place to the appellant. And there was a related point about the degree of less than substantial harm and also the Bedford judgment in relation to substantial harm. And there was a question around whether the proposals represented the optimum viable use of the site and another question around the weight to be given to alternatives. And finally, there was a question around the degree of conformity as between Hart's heritage policies and the framework because their local plan policies didn't reflect the balance contained in, paragraph, uh, in paragraphs 195 and 196 of the MPPF. So I hope that was a qu uh, helpful, quick run through of the facts of the case um, that would be useful in providing some context for the rest of our discussion. I'm going to pass over to Annika now, who will give us some legal analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosie. And um, so that's very helpful to get the sort of context there for Brams Hill. And we're now going to hand over to Annika, who's going to talk about the Court of Appeals uh, judgment. Um, Annika is a senior associate in the planning team at Herbert Smith Freehills. She's acted on a number of high profile schemes relating to the assessment of the historic environment. Uh, most recently, the Newcombe House appeal inquiry, which was recovered by the Secretary of State and which involved consideration of complex heritage issues, including the application of Palmer. So over to you, Annika. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew, and, and thank you so much, Rosie, for that overview, which was fascinating. It's a real treat, I think, to have such a detailed insight into the facts of, of a leading case like Brams Hill. So I'm going to speak to you about the legal principles set out by the Court of Appeal in the case of Brams Hill. The judgment was written by Justice Keith Lindblom, who is the supervising Lord Justice for planning in the Court of Appeal. Put simply, when Justice Lindblom speaks, planning practitioners listen. The first thing to understand about Brams Hill is that, in my view, it didn't elucidate a brand new principle for us. It reinforced much of what we already knew, but with the weight of a Court of Appeal judgment and with the clarity and lucidity that we would expect from a Limblom judgment. And given that it's a Court of Appeal judgment, I think it is now undoubtedly the leading heritage judgment and should be the first port of call for all practitioners advising in this area. So let's take a look. <laughs> Rosie's already given us an overview of the facts, so we'll, I'll jump straight into the meat of the legal judgment. Justice Limplum starts where all good judgments do at the beginning, the statutory duty in section 66 from which all else flows in heritage. The duty is to have special regard to the, deliverabil to the desirability of preserving a listed building or its setting or any features of special architectural or historic interest which it possesses. And there's a similar but not identical duty in relation to conservation areas um, in section 72. Uh, and it's not exactly the same. So in particular, conservation areas do not have settings, but there's a lot of um, similarities. NPPF paragraph 190 urges local planning authorities to identify and assess the particular significance of any heritage asset that may be affected by the proposal and to take this into account when considering the impact of a proposal on a heritage asset to avoid or minimise any con conflict between the heritage assets conservation or any aspect of the proposal. Paragraph 193 states that when considering the impact of a proposed development on the significance of a designated heritage asset, great weight should be given to the asset's conservation, and the more important the asset, the greater the weight should be. This is irrespective of whether any potential harm amounts to substantial harm, total loss, or less than substantial harm to its significance. Paragraph 194 provides that harm to or loss of the significance of a designated heritage asset from its alteration or destruction or from development within its setting should require clear and convincing justification and that substantial harm to or loss of grade two listed buildings or grade two registered parks and gardens should be exceptional and assets of the highest significance, so scheduled monuments, grade one, and two star listed buildings and registered park and gardens and world heritage sites should be wholly exceptional. So a very high test. 
Paragraph 195 provides that where proposed development will lead to substantial harm or to or total loss of a significance of a designated heritage asset, local planning authorities should refuse consent unless it can be demonstrated that the substantial harm or total loss is necessary to achieve substantial public benefits that outweigh that harm or all of those following um, apply. But in my experience, uh, the the second limb of the test is, is much more rarely used. NPPF paragraph 196 provides that where a development proposal will lead to less than substantial harm to the significance of a designated heritage asset, this harm should be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal, including where appropriate, securing its optimum viable use. So having set out these foundational principles of the heritage regime, Limblom went on to review the case law. And he started with what's probably the most famous name in heritage case law, Barnwell Manor, a court of appeal decision. In that case, Justice Sullivan said that a finding of harm is a consideration to which the decision maker must give considerable importance and weight. Sullivan considered the judgment in South Lakeland, quite an old case, which stated that the general duty in section 66 applied with particular force if harm would be caused to the setting of a grade one listed building, a designated heritage asset of the highest significance. And Jones and Mordu, also a court of appeal decision, is in my view one of the most important um, decisions for practitioners because it found that a decision maker who has worked through the paragraphs of the MPPF that I have just set out will in almost all cases comply with the section 66 duty. So before moving on to the court's consideration of PARMA, I'm just going to thoughts on the law and practice of heritage as it stands, using the principles set out by the Court of Appeal in Bramshill. I'll I will overlap slightly with Chris's excellent opening set of principles for practitioners, but some things are important enough to say twice. So here's my rule of six. First, the heritage regime. The statute, the case law, the policy, the guidance has been formulated as a series of rigorous tests and assessments. It is not a normal planning balancing exercise of the kind you would engage in utilising Section 38.5 or the normal planning balance. It is a regime which is essentially designed to protect what will often be irreplaceable treasures. Among the most common mistakes in my view is to treat this like the normal planning balance. It's not. You can't just throw things into the mix and see what comes out in the planning balance. Paragraph 196 does allow for balancing, but you need to take careful steps before you get there as Chris laid out. Second, the section 66 duty protects each asset individually. The rigorous process must be undertaken for each asset. For many assets, the assessments will overlap and the conclusions may well be the same, but the decision maker does need to turn their mind to each asset. Third, what is being protected is the significance of the asset. And as Chris emphasized, assessing whether the significance is being harmed requires forming a view on what the significance of the asset is. And it sounds very obvious, but in my experience, it's often overlooked. So for example, a building which draws its significance mainly from a very well-preserved interior may not be harmed by a new tall building down the street. Fourth, the decision maker needs to make a finding for each asset as to whether the proposals cause harm and as Chris emphasised, must form a view on the magnitude of that harm. Fifth, substantial harm will engage the strict necessity test in paragraph 195 that I've set out. Less than substantial harm will engage the balancing test in paragraph 196. Sixth, if you work carefully through the MPPF paragraphs, paying attention to the principles I've just set out, then you can write your report and feel satisfied with the blessing of Justice Sales and Jones and Mordu that you have likely discharged your legal duties. So now we've nailed the foundations, let's move on to the more novel point that Brams Hill discussed, which is the approach laid out in Palmer. So as Rosie alluded to, in Palmer, it was argued that the local planning authority had failed to consider likely harm to the setting of a listed building by noise and smell from proposed poultry sheds. Lord Justice Lewison said that giving considerable weight to harm to the setting of a listed building does not mean that the weight that the decision maker must give to the desirability of preserving the building or its setting is uniform. It will depend on, among other things, the extent of the assessed harm and the heritage value of the asset in question. Crucial part of Lewison's judgment for our present purposes 
is on the slide and he said, I would accept that where proposed development would affect a listed building or its setting in different ways, some positive and some negative, the decision maker may legitimately conclude that although each of the effects has an impact taken together, there is no overall adverse effect on the listed building or its setting. That is what the officers concluded in that case. In the Brams Hill appeal, the inspector was urged by the developer to adopt the Palmer approach and she said this, I won't read out the whole quote, but the critical passage here is the inspector's conclusion that the judgment in Palmer clearly does reinforce that a balancing exercise needs to be carried out, but it does not direct the decision maker to only one method by which that should be done. The inspector then declined to carry out the Palmer exercise in the way that the appellant urged on the basis that she thought that in the context where some of the benefits were being undertaken pursuant to different consents, a more traditional approach to the assessment of the kind that I've laid out previously, a paragraph 196 assessment was warranted. The inspector then undertook a detailed exercise of considering the various aspects of the schemes and outlined those that she considered to be harmful or beneficial with the overall conclusion that the relevant appeal, one of the 33 appeals, would be harmful to the registered park and garden, the setting of the listed buildings and would not preserve their special qualities, and that this harm would not be outweighed by public benefits. And she undertook a similar exercise for certain of the other appeals that she was considering. So what did the Court of Appeal have to say about all of this? The developer argued before the Court of Appeal that the inspector had in failing to carry out a net or internal heritage balance um, erred. The developer argued that if, on, if only if overall harm emerges from the weighing of heritage harms against heritage benefits must the other public benefits of the development be weighed against that overall harm under, under the policy in paragraph 196 of the MPPF. The inspector was wrong, says the developer, to dismiss this approach on the basis that some of the benefits would arise under separate consents. The Court of Appeal dismissed those arguments and they dismissed them pretty robustly. They said that neither Section 66 itself nor the relevant case law stipulated or implied that a decision maker must undertake a net or internal balance of heritage related benefits and harm as a self-contained exercise preceding a wider assessment of the kind envisaged in paragraph 196 of the MPPF. The separate balancing exercise may have been an exercise the inspector could have chosen to undertake when performing the section 66 duty and complying with the corresponding policies of the MPPF, but it wasn't required as a matter of law. There is no one approach, says the Court of Appeal, suitable for every proposal affecting a designated heritage asset or its setting, the approach to be taken will be a matter of planning judgment on the facts of the case, heeding the statutory scheme and basic principles of the case law. So in short, the Palmer approach is a pragmatic and lawful approach in the words of the Court of Appeal, but it's not the only approach and there's no duty on a decision maker to carry out the assessment in line with that approach. The inspector in the Bramsell case, said the Court of Appeal, could not be faulted. The approach that she took was the most realistic in the circumstances, and though the paragraph um, through the balancing exercise in the MPPF gave full credit to the benefits that would be realised, the inspector's approach was therefore upheld as lawful. So that reaches the end of the, the Bramshill case, but as Matthew alluded to, the, the last three weeks has been a flood of, of new judgments and developments in, in heritage law. So I think we're now going to move on to a discussion uh, between Matthew and Zach, um, and then hopefully we'll take some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annika. Um, so I'm now joined by Zach Simons. Uh, Zach is uh, the top rated junior planning barrister in the country. Uh, in Planning Magazine's legal survey for this year, and he acts for some of the UK's leading residential and commercial developers, central government, and a range of local authorities. And he regularly appears in court at planning appeals, uh, at inquiries and hearings, and at local plan examinations. Um, so, Zach, as, as Annika was saying just then, um, hot on the heels of Brams Hill, we've had a, 
a glut of other heritage decision uh, decisions come through and we're, we're very lucky. Um, I guess the, the place to start is Whitechapel Bell Foundry, which has caused um, a fair amount of controversy, certainly in, in the press and, and the planning uh, press as well. Uh, do you think it, it really is as shocking or surprising as, as has been made out in those articles? That's a good question. I mean, it was it, the case was called by a curator at, at the Tate, another example of money grabbing philistinism. And by the former chief executive of the Royal Academy, uh, it said it allows brutal capitalists to use British history for their own purposes and that historic England has failed in their duty. Uh, in fact, you know, taking a, a step back from, from the vitriol and from the, um, from, from the headlines, I, I don't think it's in the least a surprising decision. In fact, it, it's an unsurprising decision, a conventional application of pretty well understood principles so far as heritage is concerned. We've got a very experienced planning inspector who was applying long-standing policy tests in an orthodox way, uh, in a way that was supported by Historic England, by the officers and members of Tower Hamlets, and indeed in the end by MHCLG. We'll come back to that one. But um, it, it was a decision to grant planning permission and listed building consent to refurbish the Grade 2 star listed Bell Foundry on the Whitechapel Road in London. The, the, the key sort of bit of context for all of us to understand is, is that that was a building which, which closed down in 2017 due to the lack of demand for tower bells, which is an interesting sign of the changing times. And the scheme to replace uh, that business was uh, involved new workshops, a cafe, an event space, and next door a hotel, restaurant and workspace. Now, the, the traditional bell foundry business was no longer viable. That was accepted by the inspector, by the Secretary of State. And it, that you know, was the reason that it, that it shut down. Um, and it was found that in the end, the appeal scheme represented a sympathetic and viable proposition that would achieve long-term use, including a foundry use, which was thought to be really important. And it would be a way of bringing people in to this really important building in a way that they could you know, appreciate in the long run. There was also, Matthew, as you know, no good evidence of a viable alternative. There was evidence, but it was not persuasive evidence in the end, in the, in the view of the Inspector and Secretary of State. And that meant that however the balancing exercise was undertaken, whether it was the sort of the internal net balance that Chris and Annika were talking about, or the external balance of weighing public benefits against harm, uh, the Inspector and Secretary of State thought that benefits won out in the end. Uh, so an unsurprising decision, I think, although as, you, as you've alluded to earlier on, it did lead uh, to a surprising response from the Secretary of State. Yes. Well, we, we had a, what I felt was a fairly remarkable follow-up, which was uh, the, a tweet by the Secretary of State himself, um, in which he um, announced um, a review uh, following on from, uh, from the decision. And it you know, appeared to be suggesting, I felt, that, that, that maybe the decision was not one that he would have wished to have seen. And, and why that's remarkable is, of course, the decision letter is signed in his name. It is the decision of the Secretary of State, and, you know, upon a call in under Section 77, it's the Secretary of State who makes the decision. So whilst, you know, we recognise that there are people in, in the ministry who will, you know, in practice make those decisions, um, you know, when I was uh, studying politics at school, we were taught about something called individual ministerial responsibility, where the, the minister takes responsibility for the decisions in his department. And it, it just seemed remarkable to me that, you know, within a day or two of the decision coming out, the Secretary of State was saying, I'm on the back of this, I'm going to announce the review. And I, it's fairly unprecedented, I thought, Zach. I think very odd, uh, very, very odd indeed to, for it to happen at all. For it to happen on Twitter, <laughs> and then for the scope of the of the review, such as it is, to be targeted at two things: the planning inspectorate. Why on earth they are to be faulted, if you like, for for, for a decision in circumstances where the ministry ended up agreeing with what with what the inspector found? Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, the planning inspectorate on the one hand, and how planning policy on the other considers and defends heritage. Mm -hmm. What struck me is quite odd. Um, about that focus, if you like, for, for, for a review, is, is that as, as Annika uh, has, has explained, we know from the Mordew case in the Court of Appeal, 
But what our planning policies actually do in this area, what national policies do, is give us a series of tests to work through that have the effect of complying with statutory duties under the Listed Buildings Act. Mm. If there's a problem, and just to pause, we don't know what the problem is said to be, by the way, because the you know the minister's not 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 actually told us what the problem is. But anyway, if if there is thought to be a a problem in need of a solution, it can't be, in my view you know, a problem with the planning inspector or even a problem with the MPPF. If you want to change something, it's going to have to be the List of Buildings Act. But how such a change would be brought about, um, really with what with what sort of end in sight is totally up in the air. Mm. Yes, and, and, you know, and we have a legal framework for these decisions to be made and that mm. legal framework was followed. Um, and it seems, you know, invidious to criticise the people who made the decision for doing exactly that. That's what the rule of law is all about. So... It, it was fairly remarkable. Um, there, there were some interesting points in the case, um, I thought. Um, one of them actually has been raised in, in the Q&A that, that's come in, mm -hmm. which is the way in which you treat alternatives at, at an inquiry. And I have certainly been involved in schemes where there is local opposition um, or, or indeed from, from um, other developers who, who wish to develop the site in question. They will often put in um, schemes or outlines of schemes that they say is is a better alternative to the one that is before the inspector, and it, it is difficult to deal with at inquiry um, because you feel as though it becomes a sort of beauty contest between two schemes. But that's not that's not how the system works, is it? It doesn't uh, it doesn't treat schemes as a, a beauty contest. It really simply looks at whether the scheme before the inspector or the decision maker is acceptable on planning grounds. Right. Um, so in many ways, you should be able to say this is this is irrelevant evidence. However, and I think this is the interesting bit in particular, we have this slightly odd reference in para 196 of the NPPF to optimum uh, viable use, um, which seems to suggest by, you know, by reference to the word optimum, that the uh, decision-making process should be assessing what is the best use, which seems to take you back into the realms of actually considering alternatives. Mm. Uh, so what's your view on that, Zach? Really interesting. And you know, as you know, and it's obviously the prompt for your question is one of the issues in the uh, Foundry case, the Whitechapel Foundry case, was whether or not um, the optimum viable use had been established and indeed whether or not you know what one of the the big objectives of the scheme had, had, had successfully identified what it was and that it was something else in the context of 196 of the framework so we're in a world now where we've we've identified less than substantial harm whatever that means see chris and annika's presentations earlier we know in those circumstances we're after a balance in order to accord with our duties under the list of buildings act what does that balance how does it work well we balance it against public benefits the ppg defines that pretty broadly could be all kinds of things um public benefits of the proposal including where appropriate securing its optimum viable use does that mean that you always need to know what that optimum viable use is no it doesn't. Does it mean that if someone has worked out what it might be, that, that it must therefore necessarily be put to that use and only that use? No. M my reading of 196 is, is that where you can establish that what you're doing is the optimum viable use, you know, happy days, great stuff, because that will fortify and reinforce your public benefit case under 196. But it doesn't, in my view, go further than that i don't know what, what do you feel about that that, that approach to 196 maybe? yeah I, I, I think that has to be right um otherwise it's, it's open-ended isn't it you will you will forever be searching for a better use and you would never be able to make a decision so right. i think you have to um play the hand that is before you and um that means assessing the case based on planning policy and um and, and the legal principles that apply yeah so that must be the case um, I mean, I suppose the interesting point arising from what you said earlier, it, you know, if there is going to be a review, what would you change to make this system better? Uh, and I know you, on your blog, Zach, you, you said, you know, this may be the direction that we're going in. So yeah. do you feel there are things that we should tackle? 
interesting question. As I say, I don't think we're going to get very far simply by tinkering around, if you like, with wh whatever the planning inspector are doing, because I, I, I don't see any sort of systematic issue there that the Secretary of State might, might disagree with me. Um, I also don't see, for myself anyway, that at the moment under our current system, we'll see what come what happens in the future with the planning bill and the white paper. But under our current system, I don't see any systematic problems with the duties under the List of Building Act or the way in which those are working. If there is a problem, if there's a a, uh, a candidate um, for the proliferation of case law over the last whatever it is, almost a decade now, um, in this in this field that has uh, created more complication than simplicity, it seems to me to be the way in which the MPPF articulates these these principles. What the Court of Appeal in 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 Mordew called the fasciculus, the bundle of sticks of policies taken together in the heritage chapter, and in particular. If, if I was, you know, being a bit, just a bit radical, I'm, I'd consider sweeping away this distinction between substantial and less than substantial harm. The courts tell us that really, you know, the message from Brams Hill is it's supposed to be a straightforward balancing exercise, making sure that you give, you know, substantial weight to any heritage harm, putting it on a scale and putting public benefits on the other side of the scale and working out where you sit. And obviously it follows from that, that if you've got lots and lots of of heritage harm if it's very serious and a very precious asset that must weigh very heavily and it'll take some serious benefits whatever those might be in order to get over that um that that bar in order to justify development now it's it, i query given all of the case law and the complication that has ensued whether or not we really are served by this sort of binary distinction between substantial on the one hand and less than substantial harm on the other, because the number of cases that it has spawned um, and the number of um, you know complexities it's added rather than uh, simplifications since the 2012 MPPF introduced the distinction, mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's helped us very much. So that's something I would look at carefully. Uh, what about you, Matthew? I mean, I, just on that point, I think it sort of takes me back to the MPPF and its introduction, and it was meant to simplify things by, you know, condensing um, PPG 15. I'm, I'm, God, I'm amazing how easily you forget things, but yeah, PPG 15 and the principles in there. And actually, I think you know we're all quite comfortable with that. Um, and it feels as though where there are some places in the MPPF where, it, in seeking that simplification, it has simply opened up more. Um, arguments between the uh, the cracks, as it were, and and this, you know, it, it kind of survived for quite a long time, didn't it? But now the, those cracks appear to be stretching out a little bit. What I would say, though, is is from from the perspective of when when you are actually promoting one of these schemes, it is hugely beneficial not to be in the substantial harm category. Yeah, <laughs> and so. If by doing away with that distinction, we find ourselves having to make more arguments as to mm -hmm. how the harm is justified mm -hmm. um, because you're on a continuum, but you're never quite sure where you are on that continuum, we, we might lose something through doing that. But it's sort of it is sort of what um, Keith was uh, Keith was saying in, in Brams Hill that actually it's a it's a it's a question of judgment in every case and you just got to balance the harm against the benefits and that's yeah. kind of what you're saying isn't it that so in that case why do we need this rigid binary distinction between substantial and less than substantial indeed it, it, i mean no doubt it'll be a matter for another for, for wiser minds than ours but i mean the uh, i recall in last year's white paper second time i mentioned it that there was a promise in there uh, in the thickets of that white paper to review and update the planning framework for listed buildings and conservation mm -hmm. areas. That was a sort of dropped into the white to the white paper without much more ado or much more sort of explanation as to what that review and updating might actually look like. Literally until this week's tweet, we, 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 we've heard no more about it. Certainly I heard no more about it in, in the Queen's speech or in the notes that went along with the Queen's speech the other, the other week. Um, so, you know, there's a there's a placeholder there for a review to, mm. to, to to move forward for the MPPF to be looked at again. Um, you know, one of the big questions for me that's sort of out, left outstanding after the white paper proposals of last year is how these legal duties in the 1990 Act to have special regard to the, say the desirability of protecting listed buildings in their settings. How can all of that be? reconciled with the idea that allocation in the planning policy uh, you know gives quote unquote automatic planning permission it's a really interesting 
issues that are, are given rise to through the proposals in the white paper for in particular i think uh, growth areas or we'll have to see what happens but it but it will be a very interesting time um to for the government to be considering reform of the mppf and it looks yeah. as if that's what robert jenrick is um is after well, who knows who knows i mean i think you know the the point in whitechapel was the value of that site was undoubtedly undoubtedly greater uh, with the use that was being proposed by the the applicant than, than for the alternative yeah. and someone mentioned to me one idea which is you know when we have an artwork that we value in this country and somebody wants to buy it from abroad because they have very deep pockets we have a system where the government steps in and puts a ban on the export of that piece of art um, do we think the government needs to impose something similar here to stop the nation's heritage being lost to rapacious developers by saying, actually, you know, we're going to step in and stop this? It's certainly what would accord with some of the headlines that we've seen. It's a really interesting idea. I think we are left with it as practitioners, you know, as people in our position advising clients, and obviously Chris and Rosie as well, who actually have to do these assessments, are left in some, some uncertainty, aren't we, about how we actually go about framing our heritage assessments you know how do we how do we deal with it when it comes to doing our applications do we do our you know internal balance or or not mm -hmm. what 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 will you be advising your clients <laughs> um i'm going to advise them to uh to refer to dr chris mealy and uh if that doesn't answer it to come to zach simons um i dodged that one i want to the reason for that is i want to move on um um, to the the two more recent uh, decisions that have come out, yeah. um, which is Kinsey and the London Chess Hospital. And if you were a senior conservation officer uh, in a local authority, would you be asking for a pay rise right now? <laughs> I think the effect of these these decisions is that, you know, no one's advice counts for more, it would seem, after Kinsey and the London Chest Hospital, and indeed the Liverpool case of last year in the Court of Appeal from the Heritage Officer. At your peril, do you omit a single word that falls from their lips um, in your officer's report? It's a, it's a problem. It is, a, it's a, you know, in all seriousness, it is an issue for us all because normally the courts take a deferential approach to what's in a committee report for very good reason. That, you know, these are not supposed to be poured over like statutes or contracts. They're supposed to be practical documents written by professionals who are in a hurry and, you know, re read to, delivered to members who know what they're doing, you know. And you, you're really normally looking for something that really pretty seriously misleads members if you're going to be quashing a grant of permission on the back of what's in a committee report. Now, that's normally. More recently, um, for the, in these heritage cases, the, the, there's two now, you know, in pretty quick succession, pretty high profile quashings on the basis of failure to, you know, give every syllable, every pound, shillings and pence of what's in a conservation officer's um, objection to, uh, to members in full. Now, I think, it, you know, it's the unfortunate cases in a sense, because the practical uh, ramifications of them is, is that they'll lead to longer reports, mm. which, you know, are more defensive drafting less user-friendly documents but in the end that that's what you've got to do whether you're an applicant in this system or whether you're a local authority um you've got to make sure now that your officer report uh, your, your report to committee deals fulsomely comprehensively with everything that is said by the in particular the heritage consultees or you're at serious risk yeah i think that's absolutely right and you and i have talked about the bear traps uh, have suddenly uh, multiplied and and you know, we're back to, I think, the position we were in uh, some years ago after Forge Field and, and Barnwell Manor, where you were poring over the precise wording used in committee yeah. reports to make sure you didn't uh, get fall into one of those bear traps. And I think, you know, I, 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 I really would endorse um, what uh, Sir Duncan Easley said um, in Juden, para 77 of his judgment, where he says the thrust of Bramshill is that the court should not set out rigid frameworks for decision makers to follow, so long as the statutory duties are observed and policies interpreted, interpreted with planning sense and flexibility are applied rationally. Well, that's exactly what we ought to be happening, but it doesn't feel as though we're quite there at the moment. Um, so we all have to watch out.
I quite agree with you. Um, and I think one of the bear traps that I that has jumped out to me as a risk for us moving forward after this very interesting Brams Hill discussion is, as, as we've heard from Annika, one of the things that the courts have said is, is that, well, it shouldn't matter too much. And Chris made this point too, shouldn't matter too much. So say the judges, whether you do an internal heritage balance or whether you balance uh, benefits against harms under 196, for example. Well, let okay, but... You know, firstly, I'm not sure that's right. Uh, that's something perhaps we can come back to. But secondly, yeah. if you are going to undertake an, a, a, an internal net heritage balance, you better make darn sure that you you don't end up inadvertently double counting any of those benefits again when it comes to a 196 balance. That was a, a, an issue that arose in the London Chest Hospital case. And if we're going to all, you know, going to be doing it both ways kind of thing in the future, doing this in this heritage balance both ways, we do need to be very careful and clear about what we're doing, which benefits are coming into play when to avoid that risk. Well, let, let's let's put that to Chris, actually. Let's move on to some, Q, some questions that we've received. And one of them was around getting to the same place. So, Chris, uh, do you think that you do actually get to the same place regardless of which method you use? Or are there cases where the internal balance approach actually gets you to a different place? Well, I, I think just reflecting on practice in light of Palmer and Brams Hill, Ma Matthew, I, I think that the Palmer approach works better when you're dealing with impacts on the same asset. And if there's a straightforward accounting one against the other. Where I think it becomes difficult is when you funge the aspects, the, the impacts across different aspect, uh, uh, aspects of significance. And so in Brams Hill, there was a complicated interplay as between setting of the listed building and the registered park and garden, which were more or less one and the same. And there is a risk of double counting. Um, but I, I I, I think you genuinely, as, as I can only speak as a practitioner, I think you genuinely do get to the same place. And, and, I, and I do feel that the, whilst the emphasis on the different approaches can be helpful conceptually, I, I, I was persuaded by, um, but by Usley in the way he described and by Keith Lindman when he described what, what I characterized maybe, maybe a little unfairly, maybe wrongly if Zach, if I, if I hear Zach correctly, as a kind of relaxed approach, you know, provided you've looked at every single thing and you said, well, putting it all together because these things are related, you know, I'm left with a bunch of harm or a bunch of benefit or, or just a net neutral, really. Um, and I think that's right because this is an area of town planning which is so subject to judgment, yeah. Yeah. isn't it? I mean, more than many, I think it's probably fair to say. And, and actually, that takes me on to another question. I was, I was going to put this to Annika, actually. Um, a, a, a very good question. Um, heritage is subjective enough already. Um, Whitechapel Bell Foundry was especially so. How can calm neutrality be built into the system better? And I haven't, I haven't warned you I was going to ask you that, Annika, but um, <laughs> you, you are the most calm, neutral person I know. Uh, so, and you've seen it from both sides. So how do we do that? But Thanks, Matthew. Well, I, I think everyone should print out the Brams Hill judgment and, and read it because it it is a very simple kind of step by step process through um, through how heritage should should be considered. And and almost when you when you're reading it, you think, oh, this is all this is all so simple, and you you forget about all of these different considerations. I don't think Matthew that it's ever going that we can ever take the um emotion out, out of heritage because it's it's an emotional topic um it it is it, if that, something's been listed it, it's probably irreplaceable and i think that comes with so much emotion um and i think it's it is it is always going to be difficult and it's always going to be the kind of area where it's ripe for legal challenge because people will feel very upset um, ab about what's happening to heritage assets. I don't think we can take it away. I think we just have to be kind of, we practitioners um, on, on all sides have to take a calm approach. Um, people assessing heritage assets, 
lawyers um, considering on both sides and, and challenging. I, I think I, I think it's our duty to take a calm approach. I don't think that we can expect that people who object to developments um, will be will be calm because almost what why, why should they be <laughs> in, in a lot of senses? It, it, it's an emotional um, topic, and I think we all have to recognise that. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. And people do feel threatened by by change. And I think we have to recognise and respect that. Um, but it's hard. Um, I'm going to ask one final question um, uh, to Rosie, uh, and it, it's quite a tough one. But um, in relation to paragraph 194 of the MPPF, just how should one judge if there is clear and convincing justification for harm to a heritage asset? And that's what it's all about, really, isn't it? Well, thank you for saving that one for me, Matthew. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, my, my understanding, and Chris alluded this to this earlier, my understanding that our, is that our best authority for this really remains Bedford, the Bedford judgment. And I think there, Justice Jay found that, you know, the, the, the clear and conv convincing justification required in paragraph nine one, uh, 194 doesn't comprise a, a, a freestanding test, per se, um, and that to the extent there is a test, I think this is the wording, uh, it is that contained in paragraph 196 or 134 as was when that decision um, was made. Um, so, so clear and convincing justification, I think, is really made out on the benefits um, uh, weighed up against the harm of a development proposal, and it doesn't require a kind of prior test um, of some kind of less damaging alternative. So it, it's about assessing um, the development in front of you uh, and coming to a view on, on harm as against benefits. Thank you. And it, it is very subjective and it is very emotive. Um, so yeah, absolutely. we will continue, I'm sure, to be involved in these battle royales for many years to come. I wish we had more time. I'm conscious that our time is up though. Uh, it's been a fascinating discussion. I'd like to thank all of our speakers today, Dr. Chris Mealy, Rosie Adamson, uh, Annika Holden and Zach Simons. And I'm sure the debate will continue, but for now, that's it. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much.